Welcome, everyone. Delighted to have you joining us here for a TechSoup Connect event. So we always start our events off with a land acknowledgement. Think of this as my draft version because we're only going to get better through the course of today. So this event here is on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Or at least as a virtual event, that's where I'm coming to you from. So when I say unseated, what I really mean is I'm using a fancy word which means stolen. And so as one of our next steps, I invite you to join me in the land back movement, probably starting with our crown land. So that's my first attempt at our land acknowledgement today. And now I'm gonna pass us over to our expert. So today we've got Rowena Valen here with us, who is a founder and lead instructor of the New School of Fundraising. Rowena is a fundraiser, consultant, teacher, and mentor, and she's been working within the nonprofit sector since 2003. She's held a number of positions at different organizations and also ran a consultancy. Rowena has taught fundraising-related courses at BCIT and the Art Institute of Vancouver, in addition to, of course, her own school. And she's been a panelist wherever you need a smart person to talk about fundraising. So with that, let me pass the mic over to our guest expert today. And you can say hello by putting a clapping emoji right there into the chat. Thanks for having me here. I'm super excited to be here. I am appreciative of all of your time. I'm joining from the beautiful lands of the Coast Salish people here in what's known as North Vancouver, and that is the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Asians. And on days like this, when I look out my window and I can see beautiful snow-clad mountains and green trees and sunshine, I'm forever grateful for their stewardship of our land. And I do think that our role in nonprofits is tied so beautifully into Indigenous culture as I learn more about it and looking forward to the next seven generations because I honestly think anyone who is involved in nonprofits, we're also looking forward, to, right? We're also looking forward and passing forward and moving ahead and thinking about the future in so many ways, thinking about a future that's cured of diseases and a future where we have a clean environment and a future where everybody has food and the necessities they need. So. Our tie between Indigenous cultures, many Indigenous cultures, and our own beliefs in what we're doing is so strong. So thank you so much for being here. I'm just grateful. We've got someone named Lindsay who's already asked the first question in chat, which is Great. awesome. And I encourage you, all of you, through the course of this event, keep adding your questions into the chat whenever it comes to mind, and we'll make sure that we circle back to it as it becomes appropriate within the event slow. Yeah, oh, okay. You know what, Lindsay? Let's, can you hold on to that for a second? We'll go through our, the presentation and the chat, and then can you let me know if that was answered? Okay. So we'll get through that. We'll talk about that if that's okay. So let's, we'll jump into that, Eli, if that's okay. Absolutely. And as well, when I'm hosting through my school, I do say, I do, when we're on Zoom, I do acknowledge. And then I often say, if everybody could silently acknowledge the lands that you are joining from, no matter where you're from, that would be wonderful. And then I would give a moment. I will ask that too. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move ahead. You have heard a little bit about me, but I will also tell you how I got to be here with you all today as well. My family grew up very far from my Indigenous heritage. I am Deneza, and my community is West Moberly Lake, which in, is the north of BC. I used to, I grew up in Prince George, so I used to call Prince George North, but I've been corrected. That's central. West Moberly is north, for sure. And so I, I have been a professional fundraiser for 20 years, and I love fundraising. I also am reconnecting to my own Indigenous cultures and learning, meeting my family, many family members for the first time. And so we actually saw a role for my fundraising school to bridge this and to help nonprofits and fundraisers. We have a full two-hour workshop 
Maybe I'll ask if Ben or Eli can put that into the chat as well. We have a full two-hour workshop, which goes into much more depth than we can cover today. We think of this like a teaser. And we go into a lot of more, a lot more depth and more topics in this area as well. And we offer that about every two months. And it's a small group. There's 10 total that can participate. It's very much meant to be a moment, a bonding moment, anything. And we're actually always, or actually usually asked for private bookings as well, if that's something that you're interested in exploring more with your team. So I'd love to hear from you guys. We do, Lori, we do private bookings so we can be booked for the two-hour workshop privately as well. So you could reach out to me at any time through the school. I'd like to hear into the chat. Quick question. If I was, if I said, okay, what is your knowledge on what I would just say Indigenous protocols? So you're here, obviously. If you were thinking, two, what are these words you're speaking, Rowena, to 10 of, I'm a little bit upset that Eli and Ben didn't ask me to host this session, where would you fit in there? In a zero to 10, where is your knowledge? Where do you feel your knowledge is of this area? Oh, great. Thanks, everyone. Oh, thanks. I really appreciate it. That helps a lot. And feel free to keep going. I'll see them, them coming up as we go. So today we're going to talk a little bit about some background and terminology. And then we'll talk about our land and territory acknowledgements. And then I'm here for questions. So if, as I said before, this is one section of about four that we explore in our bigger workshop. And so if you have questions outside of what we talk about, I'll gladly answer that if I can, or I will maybe direct you somewhere else. So when we're going to start with Indigenous worldview and the concept that, first of all, the concept that there are no, there's many cultures. And the, the last part of that, the culture is not the same across what we now call Canada. Cultures are not the same. Protocols are not the same. And there can be criticism of how could we have an Indigenous protocols that we talk about for fundraisers in all of Canada. So we have people, I believe, here from the East Coast, from Central Canada, from West Coast. So what we actually want to share is there's a lot of similarities. And in fact, we want to ask questions more about the journey of how do you find information in your communities? Because the finding information is quite similar in terms of how to approach it. And we're all in fundraising and we're all in nonprofits. So it is also about the relationships. So when we look at Indigenous worldviews, things that tend to be more common are the fact that we are all and everything's connected and that there's respectful relationships around us, no matter where it is or who it is. Wonderful opportunity for you to learn more about culture in your communities, storytelling, delving down into that. And the concept of reciprocity, which is interesting because it is really about giving and receiving. I did a workshop once for an Indigenous board. It was the first time I was in front of an Indigenous board and realized at that time how different traditional fundraising is and how we teach it compared to Indigenous cultures for that organization. And they said something like, if we look at stewardship and our focus on stewardship, and I said to them at one point, when I was in fundraising school 20 years ago, we were taught to say thank you seven times. I don't know if anyone else remembers that or was taught that, but that you couldn't say thank you enough. Where the concept of reciprocity is this, that we should give for our own not even reward or goodness, but it's just like balancing of the community. And a wonderful member of that board said, if my family in our culture, if my family had more and another family needed something or didn't have that, we would just give them what they needed quietly. It wasn't meant to be shown. It didn't have to say thank you. That was really important in terms of the difference of that Indigenous worldview. And storytelling. So much storytelling. For our workshop, we have an elder start us off in a good way. And Elder Dean is from my community. And to be honest, I never actually know what Elder Dean is going to say to the group. Sometimes he talks for five minutes and sometimes he talks for 20 minutes. But what we do know is that he will share what needs to be shared that morning when he gets online. We have two workshops with him next Monday and Tuesday. And I was talking to him yesterday and I have no idea what he's going to say. I don't script that. 
he just knows that he's going to open the workshop. And I can tell you that from the feedback, it's so valuable to everyone. And it may be something that he'll say the creator told him last night, something he dreamed about. It could be a, for him, sometimes it's a, a seasonal approach. Sometimes it's talking about natural law, but he is always sharing stories. And sometimes as the stories are being shared, we might think, I'm not entirely sure what this has to do with what I'm here for. But I think that's part of the journey. And it's just appreciating any opportunity you have to sit down and hear those stories. And they come back to you in the most unlikely times. I know Elder Dean, I hear his stories a lot. And it'll be a few days later and something will happen in my life. And I'll think back to something that he shared with me. And it'll all make sense. So it's really a storytelling. Most of it is a very much a storytelling culture. So one thing is terminology, and I, we get asked a lot about this in our workshop. Of course, we hear the words Indigenous and Aboriginal and Native and other words. And really, there's a lot of historic terms and there's historical terms. We, my family, and I feel I can't say this, we're like, we less, are we back in the day when I grew up in French Church? I used to say I am Indian and Ukrainian and Polish. We, as we don't say that anymore, it is a derogatory term. Then I was, then I would identify as First Nations. And then for a while it was Aboriginal and now it's Indigenous. And so really when in doubt, it's important to use the word Indigenous as it is internationally recognized. But we all pre also appreciate that those other words exist in titles. We have Native Friendship Centers, Native Education College. We have Aboriginal in titles. We have the word Indian in titles, for example, the Indian Act. I have, we have, we also say in our workshop, there's many times where Indigenous people refer to themselves as Indian. And that is something that is up to them to do, but it is not a term that everybody would use. It is for them to use as well. Does anyone have any questions about terminology or world views at all. You guys are good? Okay. You can raise your virtual hand and come off mute if you want, or you can always type into the chat. So let's go through land and territory acknowledgements. So these are historic, these go back very far. They are historically practiced between indigenous groups to recognize the land or territory that you were visiting. I was at in, in Whistler, and listening to a cultural event. And they were saying that they used to, different groups used to, different families, different nations used to, there'd be warring, of course, but they would go visit each other. So they would paddle up the inlet, land in someone else's nation or territory, and they would acknowledge that they were visiting there. And now we use that, and we use it as a basic act of reconciliation. Just like Eli did the, when he started, and I did as well, and many of you did in the chat as well. And we respect and recognize the descendants of the first peoples, oh, sorry, spelling mistake, that was me this morning, who came from these territories. This is a quote from Northwestern University, and I find it just really grounds us really well. It is important to understand the longstanding history that has brought you to reside on the land and to seek to understand your place within that history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in the past tense or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. And what we'll do over the next little bit here is we'll explore your own land acknowledgement. I hope to give you some resources and ask, answer any questions that you have and think about how that relates to our nonprofit world. This is, we always say, this is not cultural competency. It is more about how does this all relate to our nonprofit community world and what we're doing. So the first thing we really have to do is find out whose land are we on. And so some tips or tricks could be, there's often a local band office wherever you are in Canada, I will say. And you can call the local band office to get, you can often call the local band office to get some resources in this way. One hint is that sometimes it's hard, pronunciation is hard, and we know that. I can say in our Squamish nation here, the, the number seven is used their spelling. And so sometimes you can't think, you actually are not sure how you would sound something out. So 
one thing you can do is you could call at times a local band office after office hours, and sometimes you can listen to their recording. So that is a way to often hear potentially what, how to pronounce the lands that they're on. You most likely, you might have access to friendship centers and friendship centers are a national group of organizations that are tied to indigenous cultures and events, and they often can help you with that as well. There's not one in every community, but mid to larger communities usually have. You could check out the two links there, the, the Who's Land link and the nativeland.ca is also a link. And I can tell you that YouTube can be your best friend as well. So when I have done things where I am looking to know, say I was going to figure out how to say slay with you. And that is, I'm going to actually put it in the chat. And you can see, I might put it in the chat. Oh, here we go. This is from my community here. So you can see it's traditional spelling. And then they have more of a phonetic spelling. And so if I'm still not sure, and that is something that you remember from the phonetic spelling, you could still be unsure about, I would potentially Google it and see what videos I could find of people saying that, people from the local community saying it. I've done that for guest speakers that are coming to the school. I found videos of them introducing themselves on YouTube, and I've just listened to it. 10 times over and said it out loud and said it out loud and said it out loud. And just my time trying my best to say things properly. But I do find that YouTube, Googling it can be a great resource for you as well as any of those that we've identified above. I also want to keep in mind that as nonprofits pre-COVID, do I say this? I feel like I'm jinxing myself. We're often traveling. So we might be traveling to another community and hosting an event or hosting a breakfast or doing something where we need to learn what's in that local community. So it's better to get all of that done ahead of time and figure that out for yourself before you get there. Thank you. So this is self-reflection time. So one of the things that we really feel passionately about this at our school, and again, this is really just our view of this. And there's many views and many of you might've taken workshops about this already. We have two Indigenous instructors who teach our workshop, and we have quite a few elders who have helped us out with our content. But we really feel passionate about making it personal and figuring out what is your personal link to that. So why am I doing this acknowledgement? I think it's actually good to explore something like that with yourself. If you're answering about because I was told to, then I think we need to dig deeper. Right. And if we have team members who are like, I'm doing it because I'm supposed to, we need to have conversations about what does it really mean and why do we do it? Because I actually think that we don't talk enough about its significance. We hear it happen and then we think, oh, we're just supposed to do that. But when we can dig down into the history of it, why we do it and what it means, second, what it means to me. That's where the magic happens. So I really encourage you and your teams, yourself to explore that. Of course, you need to figure out whose territories am I on. Eli used the word unseated. You need to find out not only the territories in terms of their names, but you will hear the word unseated. You'll hear the word stolen. It's really what your comfort level is. We do say in the school, we don't actually put stolen up on the, on our webpage. Oh, unseated is here. I'll put it in. Thanks, Bobby. I'll put it in. Unseated. And I just pulled up the actual dictionary. The land was never legally ceded or given to the crown through a treaty or other agreement. And so many of the treaties happen starting in the east of Vancouver. And so when you move west, and you get to BC, there's actually less of our province that are treaty territory. So you need to know, oh, yeah. So you need to know what kind of land is that from? What territory is that? Is it a treaty? Is it a, and so that's some of your homework. So it's more of the factual or technical aspect of what you're doing. Then you are welcome then to delve into any side of it that you want. I think that we should further explore. It's such a lovely thing to do. What are their cultures? What are their traditions? 
I have a nine-year-old daughter. And again, I'm in, in North Vancouver. And they, she learns a lot at school. I find elementary schools now, they're learning so much. And we're actually hearing now that the children are learning past the parents because we didn't learn that in school. I didn't, which probably dates me. But what are the cultures and traditions? And so my daughter and I, we really like to learn the traditional stories of the surroundings around us so that we can look at them and think differently about them. But what are you interested in? We talked about what is the history of the land or their treaties and am I respecting the people from these lands? We had somebody in a workshop went and say, I'm really interested in Indigenous art. So I'm an artist and would love to do that. And I would love to help to highlight Indigenous artists and to pass that forward. We've had people say, I'm really interested in music. I'm really interested in, I think it's really important to connect with it on a level that you that you find interesting and that you'll pursue, not just for the fact of just going to read about these cultures, but connect with the stories, connect with what you think is sting for you. Can I ask in the chat, what do you think you would connect with? What do you think can fit? I mean, I work at Snow's for its land is pivotal. The fact that it's shared with us is key. Oh, that's so great. Food, Cindy, delicious. My daughter made bannock the other day for the first time at school and it was delicious. Oh, that's so nice, Kate. I just, my only, I please keep coming. I think it's fantastic. My only regret is that we're not all just in a room together. So that's, this is what we're thinking. We are in a room together. What a great group of people. Stewardship, the importance of nature, art. Look at that. So many amazing books. I can tell you that the books for the kids in elementary school are great reads if you have any kids in elementary school. We were at Laura. We were told that the land we were on was land that was not seeded or unseeded, but used to travel through by the... I don't know how to say that language group. On the map, it says treaty group. Yes, there's there's sometimes quite complicated stories behind the land as well. So thank you for sharing that, Laura. If you're trying to learn through connections such as stories and meetings and knowledge keepers and elders. Oh, thanks, everyone. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Eli. So delivering your land acknowledgement. I think that if you're comfortable delivering your land acknowledgement, that's great. I think that. There's many places sometimes where we don't do it. I'm online almost every day, so I deliver them all the time. But I can tell you, it's, I don't know if anybody has ever, you turn, somebody, you're with a group of friends and then somebody walks up and you go to turn to friends and these could be people you've known forever and you have that brief moment of, I'm going to forget someone's name. And these are people you've known for 20 years. Have you ever had, I, I've had that, right? Oh my gosh, like maybe I'm going to forget. I had that like terror of I'm going to forget one of these nations names. And I literally have. And so I had cheat sheets for myself. I had it out. I was like, there was sweat. Like it was like, it was a big thing until I got really comfortable. And now it, it becomes more. And Kate, thank you. I've had the advice. Don't worry about getting perfect. Just do it. I totally agree. So it becomes more natural to you. The more you do it, the less scripted you sound. And so I would just say, I would say, what other ways can you do it? Do you have a team meeting where that's actually just something that you do at your team meeting, even though you normally wouldn't do a land acknowledgement, but it's an opportunity for people to share and to take turns practicing. And so when we think of it, often maybe like the most senior person in your organization, they always do the land acknowledgement because they're chairing the meeting. I work with a lot of, my school has a lot of more junior team members as well in some of our programming. And we have so many opportunities for them to have that moment. And I can tell you most of the time they're saying to me, Rowena, that's the first time I've ever done a land acknowledgement. And they're excited. They're like, I was nervous, but I was excited and I did it. And Kate, it's about what you said. It's about just trying it out. But if you've not had the opportunity to try it, you don't want that first time to be at a big event. And that's when it really sounds scripted. So how can you create opportunities to practice in a safe place. And I just encourage you to do that. And then recognize, like what you said, recognize you might make mistakes in your learning. And I think it is upon us to try our best to practice and try to get this pronunciation right and those names right. And sometimes we just might not do it right then. And it's okay to just try and say, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that. I've been practicing. 
I did my best, but I think, I think that the effort is appreciated for sure on the front end of, on the end. Bobby says, is scary as the last thing we want to do is offend or alienate the people who we're trying to show respect? Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of our workshop, we talk about, I think when we look at what, who we are in nonprofit, we are people who have a huge amount of empathy, huge amount of compassion. This is a topic that is really raw for a lot of people. I kid you not that we often in our workshop have someone bursting into tears. It's a safe place for them to do that. And they feel a weight of guilt about something that they can't seem to get rid of because they don't, they weren't here during that time. They are trying their best and they just don't know how to move forward. But it is about just trying our best. And if we allow that to stop us from those relationships and from those efforts, that's to me more sad than trying it out. And I don't think, Bobby, in terms of, I don't think that you would offend or alienate. I think we can appreciate that event, that offense might come somewhere. We don't know where. And for us, it's just about saying we tried our best. We apologize. Help me to learn more about what's happened for you in that and how I can move forward. So I just hope that gets everyone kind of moving on this. Thanks for the questions and that. Okay. We're going to have to watch a quick video. Hello. Hello. First, I'd like to remind everyone here to turn off your cell phones. <laughs> Before we begin this evening's performance, we would like to acknowledge that this theater stands on territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron Wendat, and the Patoon First Nations. We are also mindful of broken covenants and the need to make right with all our relations. And now, please enjoy the show. Oh, sorry. Oh, Hello. Yes. Sorry. Excuse me. Should we? Should we go? Excuse me? Oh, no, I just mean if we're on someone else's land, shouldn't we, shouldn't we leave? Oh, no, the, the theater is here now. We just like to acknowledge whose land it is. I'm sorry, I'm so confused. So if we're on someone else's land, shouldn't we do something about that? Or hopefully we'll enjoy the performance. Oh, okay. So some of the money from the ticket sales of the show are going to the indigenous communities? No. A portion of them? No, the ticket sales go to the theater. So is the money from the bottled water sold here going to the First Nations for clean drinking water? Or Oh, no, that money goes to Nestle. Yes. They're a sponsor. I'm so sorry. I, I'm so confused. So whose land are we on? What, what are we doing? It's a dialogue. How are we making? There's a, there's a plaque you can read in the lobby. I'm just, I don't understand. I'm getting a message from the stage manager that we need to begin the show. So please take your seats. Have a good time. But good night. So sit down. Enjoy the show. Let's enjoy the show. Eli, we can stay in this screen. We don't have to go back to the deck. So thoughts? I feel the nodding. And I find when we share that in the workshop, it's almost a little bit, yeah, then thought provoking. It's almost a little bit like we see it's funny, but are we supposed to laugh? Is it supposed to be funny? Oh, I think that we share that because for great Canadian skit, and I have run it by many Indigenous people and everyone, yes, Bobby, the clean drinking water issue is horrific. It is true. I run it by many Indigenous people and everyone thinks it is funny. I've never found it offensive to anybody as well. And I just think as nonprofits, how are we, how, what are we doing to be more than the plaque on the wall? What are we doing to be more than that plaque? And Laura, it's right. It is more uncomfortable for sure. Sometimes we have to get uncomfortable to get through something. It gets sticky, get messy. But what do we do to be more than that plaque? If the land acknowledgement is, yes, and Allison, an Indigenous friend always says, if you stole my phone, would it make it better to acknowledge this phone is yours? Absolutely. Many very heated conversations about that. But what are we doing to move forward in more meaningful ways? What are we doing to create relationships? So it's not just a one-off land acknowledgement. Our whole industry is about relationship building. And this is a lovely opportunity to do that. I'll go back to the very beginning of the question at the beginning. I think it was from Lindsay. Your land acknowledgement is always, it's just if we think of it just like that, one nation going to visit another nation. If I am Rowena Nation going to visit Bobby Nation, I acknowledge that I'm 
on Bobby Nation. But if but somebody on their land do, does not, somebody from that land does not acknowledge the nation in that way or do that, they would do somebody, something that would be called a welcome. So if you had a local nation representative come, they would do a welcome. I would not, I would say in my experience that one land acknowledgement is fine for an event. I wouldn't keep going, but I've been at plenty of events where people just want to do it. So I think that's definitely, I don't think, sometimes it's not, this is the rule for that, which is part of the beauty of it is there's not a hard and fast rule often. I'm sure everyone's been to say a panel event where uh, the moderator or the host does a land acknowledgement at the beginning. And then as the panelists speak, they all do their own as well. And so that is, something I've never really scripted into anything, but I've seen it more often as time goes on. I've seen it more happen more often. Sometimes I'm in situations where because of timing, I actually would prefer that people didn't all do it. And so there can be something that you, at the beginning when I said I was acknowledging and I was just leaving it for everyone to silently acknowledge the lands that you're on. That's often what we do at our school so that we save that little bit of time from everyone feeling they have to do it. And I also don't want to um, make anyone uncomfortable by the three people ahead of them doing it. And maybe that fourth person is somebody who doesn't know. And I don't want them to feel that. Maybe they've never said it out loud. Maybe they're still on the beginning of this journey. So I always am conscientious of how to try to level that playing field to make sure everyone's comfortable. I think probably everyone's been somewhere where no matter what it is, as people introduce or start something, they do it in a way that you're just like, oh gosh, I wasn't prepared for that. And then we are all like, wow. So that's what I want to create too. Ben shared my email address. And so definitely always feel free to reach out at any time, but I'll open it. Oh, and so then I would think I'll end off with the last slide, which we won't sure I'll just talk it through of thinking where do your land acknowledgements exist? And when would we use them? I can think of, I think we think of them often in more of a business setting. If we're on a, if we're doing a luncheon at a hotel, or sometimes if we're at a board meeting, but do we do them? We see them now more often on websites. I was actually just crafting a land acknowledgement for my other part-time job. And so I was crafting that for them. We see them in signatures on emails. We see land acknowledgements more as a, like a, I know we have one instructor who used to work at SFU. And so SFU itself in their different campuses at Simon Fraser University, they have their land acknowledgements. She worked for a specific department and their department made their own land acknowledgement and commitment. And so when you see them written, they're often times actionable or there's a commitment there. So they're which don't look at the schools because it doesn't have that. And every time I teach this or say it out loud, I think mental learning it, go back and change the school's land acknowledgement on my page. But it's often, how do you bring it to life? What is your commitment? And that may be. And I get asked sometimes, mine is scripted because I'm part of an organization and they've decided. That's great. How much can you personalize that? Do you have the opportunity to personalize it? What does that look like? Are you able to put a more personal one on your signature? I think these are just conversations to be had and to ask. That's it. That's all I prepared for all of you. But I am absolutely would love to have any questions that you had, no matter what those questions are. Hi there, friends. You've got two ways to engage with questions today. Maybe you're shy or in a place where you can't turn on your mic. You could throw something right there into the chat or feeling a little braver today. You can always, of course, turn on your camera and mic and come join us here today. Most of you should have that ability as well. Bonnie, how do you navigate conversations with stakeholders who have strong feelings against land acknowledgement? That's a great question. I can share that. It's a journey, isn't it? And there's strong feelings associated with this topic. In here in not to 
I, I think this is quite public. It's been in the news, but our, is it West Vancouver Council has decided to not do a verbal land acknowledgement before their meetings, city council. And I can tell you, it is like all over the news and the Squamish Nation has contributed to what they think about that. And the school district has done letters from teachers. And so I think that I would say to my daughter, we can only control, yes, that friend has that rule and does that or acts that way. We can only control what happens in our family. And I do think it's a little bit like that. So do I think everybody's going to come along and be in the same part of the journey? No, we can do our best. And I think we just have to approach it with kindness and try to understand. I would want to understand why. And maybe there's something on the back end of that. But I don't think that everybody's always going to be in the same place. hope that answers your question. I'm just going to go back. Allison, in my work with nonprofits, I always remind people in my territorial acknowledgement that nonprofits have been active partners in the colonial project, a churches and residential schools. And that is the truth, part of the truth and reconciliation. Thank you for sharing that, Allison. Nice to see your name come up. Oh, Renata. Do you have a question for, oh, a voice question. How can you yes. <laughs> Thank you. I guess recognizing that the construct of modern nation states as they are recognized globally and borders are colonial constructs and have been enforced perhaps by settlers and imperialism and so forth. I guess I'm trying to reconcile and wondering if you have any direction for the resources and learning I can do between recognizing, of course, the Indigenous peoples and the various territories of this land, but knowing at least a little bit that I know as background having immigrant and settler background, recognizing that my understanding is Indigenous peoples don't necessarily enforce ownership in the same rigid ways that we do a colonial state system. So I was curious if you had any direction to further learning to reconcile that. Yeah, I guess that perspective. Thank you for asking. I will start by saying I, I really feel like I'm probably some on a similar journey to you, really. Really growing up, I can share my grandmother spent 15 years in residential school. She was there. She arrived when she was three and she left when she was 18. And she stayed there every day in, in, in that 15 years. She didn't go back to community. So we were really separated from community. So I feel I'm on a similar journey. Two years ago, I took, it's a course and maybe Ben or Eli can Google this. It's called, I think it's called Indigenous Canada with the University of Alberta. And it's a free course. It is 12, 12 weeks, I think it was. It's so great. Every week is a video. So I would get on like my elliptical and watch the video and just be really engaged. And then I actually had an Indigenous cousin that I had met that was similar to me. And so we then agreed every week to to jump on a Zoom call together and talk about it. So it's made to do with people around you. To me, that's also accountability. So I'm like, oh, I've got to call her, i got to watch it. And we all get very busy. So it's neat to put a group together where then you can, you can talk about it. But it has some really great baseline learning. I learned so much. So I, I highly recommend that. I think it could help. Sherry said, would you be able to share more information about the two-hour workshop that you host? And I think it was, oh, yeah, Ben put it in there. Thank you. Oh, thank you for the kind words. Thank you for the answer. Twitter account. I'm just seeing if there's another question. Let me enter me. Oh, yes, Ben, a presentation by the Downey and Wenjack Foundation. And this That's is right. for Downey, yeah. That must have been amazing. For sure, they're doing some Very really great cool. work. Any other questions? Happy to field them. Oh yeah, Chrissy. Hi, I just wanted to share a resource that, and it's actually uh, yeah. related, Renata, to your question a bit in my mind anyway. And that is just understanding like the different worldviews that maybe are, really exist in the structure <laughs> of institutions and teasing that apart and where I've come across it mostly is actually when my kids have questions and I realize how many steps back I have to go to explain that the 
the whole picture. <laughs> there's there, there's so many assumptions that even my, so my children are 13 almost and nine. And even at their age, there are so many things that they just pick up along the way in, in the medical system and the school system. And while there are attempts to address different worldviews, I think that really sinking our teeth into prioritizing that knowledge in a way is really helpful, or I've found it to be helpful. And I was going to put in a resource, if it's okay, Rowena, by Monique Gray Smith, called Speaking Our Truth, a book that she wrote. And so it's a book for youth. I'm putting it from Amazon here because it's the first one that I touched. You can get it at the library too. And it was written for youth. But actually, like, I have found that a great place to start for myself, like books for kids. She, Monique Grace Smith has written so many beautiful books, but that one I found it was more like youth target audience. And it was really helpful for me to almost get a bit of a script because, yeah, as you can tell, sometimes I tend to go on and struggle with <laughs> getting to the crux of the matter. Anyway, so just wanted to share that. And thank you so much. for that. Thank you so much, Christy, for sharing. I already Googled it. I'm going to order it. So I really appreciate it. I do think there's a lot out there that I can share. I just, there's beautiful books, Seven Fallen, Fe Seven Fallen Feathers. I'm, I just read Five Little Indians about six months ago, and it was one of the most amazingly impactful reads I've ever read in my life. And so that is, I was going to, a, and Michelle Good is the author, and she spoke in Vancouver a few months ago. And I can tell you there was like ugly crying. We got to the point of ugly crying. I was there with a friend and she looked at me and said, are you okay? But I thought, I'm fine. Really amazing in narrative books as well. So thank you, Christy, for sharing. If anyone else has anything that they want to throw into the chat as a resource, Oh, braiding sweetgrass. Oh, so good. I shared that. If you all want to connect with me on LinkedIn, you're welcome to. I shared that on my LinkedIn feed on Orange Shirt Day this year. And it, Robin Wild Killett Murr, a friend of mine, sent me the book and said she felt like she was my spirit animal and in the nicest way. And, and she just said, I feel like she has a similar story to my own of being really removed from community and finding her way back. And wow, she's, it's a beautiful read for sure. That's a great read. Thank you. So appreciate to everyone who's sharing these links. We will actually be including the key links from the chat in the post demand email we send out probably tomorrow along with the video and slide. Thank you, Eli. My question is if your land is not cut and dry, if it is like a land, then it's not really a land acknowledgement, then it would be more just our land was used for the language group of the Ankhmenam people? Or what would you, would you do in that case? I would say to just try to find, I would say that I'm probably not the one who can chime in as much not knowing your story, yeah. uh, but I would just try to find out the story and in terms of how they would acknowledge as well. Because ultimately, yeah. I think they'll have that because that, that goes back so far. If somebody would have visited from another, like how would that be acknowledged? Yeah, I would say that it does get quite complicated. Some of the communities are quite complicated and it is true because then there's like little pockets within that further makes it more complex. And so people get a little bit worried. I often say, I look to the bigger entities are, that are close by physically and how are they doing it to see first if, so for example, I'm on the North Shore, I might look to the city of North Vancouver or Capilato University or Lionsgate Hospital. I pick larger institutions around me and then I might just actually check out their webpage or I might see if they have a land acknowledgement. I used to work for the Richmond School District, and at that time, the City Hall wasn't doing it land acknowledgements because they said there was an ongoing law lawsuit or because it's a court issue, they don't want to do anything to affect, they don't want to admit any unceded territory because then it becomes, oh, you, you said in all this time. So anyways, it's complicated, and I've heard three different versions that I'm just not sure which one it's the, yeah. I guess we would just have to ask the different actual community, indigenous communities. 
That's true. And, and even us when people could help me if they've got it. I think I've, sometimes I've gotten advice from friendly, I would call it friendly, other nonprofits, like an indigenous nonprofit that is in our community that potentially might be able to help knowing like nonprofit to nonprofit. And so I think we could look that way too. Sometimes we were looking for elders once for a community, for an event, to open an event. And I found an indigenous nonprofit that we knew. Always being very careful of valuing time, not their, like paying for time as spent and things like that. But they helped with, sometimes they had a, a resident elder. And so they're like, he loves help out. We pay him for that. So yeah, that might be an avenue as well. Thanks. Or friend or friendship center. They might be able to help. Okay, perfect. And further. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks. And Janet, for clarity, as settlers, we acknowledge the land we are on at our event, webpage building, et cetera. Those of the nations, the land belongs to would welcome us if we are hosting the event or partners at, on the event. Yes. When we do the full workshop, we talk about the fact that if it's a larger event, and if you say go down and it's a business in Kelowna event or a business in Halifax event, like something like a, you see those and then they potentially have somebody welcome. And when they do a welcome, it is someone from the nation. A land acknowledgement tends to be more the settler acknowledges that they're on the land. But if you had somebody who is Indigenous who is not from that land, they often will acknowledge their, their land is that land too. And potentially in a well, they would do the welcome. So they would look, but it depends because if you had the welcome, that would be the person doing it. So then you might be saying your MC then that acknowledges in their opening remarks. Income anywhere. Does that help, Janet? No problem. Awesome. So I think we are close to bringing this to a wrap. What do you think, Rowena? I am so pleased to have spent this time with you guys and good luck with your journeys and take a look at what we have with the school. I hope to see you in our virtual classroom one day. It's a fun, it's a fun group. So thank you so much, Rowena. Super grateful for your time and sharing your expertise. 